And I'd like to welcome those online as well that are joining us uh, by Zoom. Um, uh, you're all extremely welcome. Um, and may I ask you to make sure your mobile phones are either on silent or turned off. And maybe I can I ask those online if they would mute themselves and turn off their camera. It might make a, a reception that little bit easier. This evening's lecture is entitled A Peaceable and Orderly County, an analysis of police public relations in Car in Carroll County during the War of Independence. And it's going to be given this evening by Adam King. A little bit about Adam. Adam is a graduate of Carroll College uh, St. Patrick's, where he completed his undergraduate degree in English and history in 2019, before serving for a year as its student union president. He is currently an MPhil candidate in Modern Irish History at Trinity College. His research interests include, but are not limited to, uh, local social history, education, and law enforcement in the early modern uh, and modern Ireland. He has previously published a paper on the national school system in Carlow Town and is currently researching the role of the Royal Navy during the Irish Revolution. He's local as well as he lives in Fenna, uh, just out the road. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Adam King. Thank you. Oh, um, well, first of all, I'd like to just thank you to our Say a quick thank you to Richard and all the, the team of the Carlo um, Historical and Archaeological Society, uh, who, in their infinite wisdom, invited me along to this talk this evening. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. And actually, I might as well lay my cards on the table and say this is the first time I've ever given a proper talk of any description at all, never mind one in person. So I have to say it's wonderful here to see you all. And it's a, it's a great turnout, actually, for the sort of, as Richard said, the very first online or in-person lecture we've had since, um, yeah, since COVID. So on that note, um, now that I have a captive audience, I suppose I'd just like to talk a little bit for the next, let's say, probably about half an hour, 40 minutes, about uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary and their particular role in the War of Independence in Carlow County. Now, when we think of the RIC, it's just to clarify it before we get into the meat of the subject, but I'm sure it's mostly, if not all of you know, um, the Royal Irish Constabulary were the, uh, they were essentially Ireland's colonial police force. They were established in, I believe it was 1822, with the Irish Constabulary Act, and at that time they were actually just known as the Irish Constabulary. They had yet to achieve the title of royal. And that persisted up until 1867, when they helped put down the Fenian Rising in 1867 here in Ireland. And for their services, they were granted the title of Royal, and that was because they had rendered services to Queen Victoria at the time. And this is kind of how I got interested in this particular topic, because there's a great deal written about the RIC up until the War of Independence. After we get to that point, we tend to, we talk about them in a very singular fashion. You have the IRA and our revolutionaries, and then you've got the IRA or the RIC, who were the, the arms of the government exactly. We tend not to look into detail about the individuals, uh, the regional nuance that characterize the relationship between police and people. So that's sort of, that was my motivator, because I did notice there was very little written about the RIC in general and even less written about their role in Carlow County. And we'll get on to that in a bit. So, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm very sorry, not a great picture. Uh, I've put on quite a bit of weight since then and got quite a few gray hairs since. But again, COVID wasn't kind to me at all. So that's me, Adam Kane. That's my baby, the dissertation there I'm holding. That's actually a photocopy of this paper. Um, I don't suppose there's really a need to go into any of this because Richard just introduced me perfectly. But I'm an English and history graduate. Um, I'm studying uh, modern Irish history in Trinity College at the moment. 
and I have a particular interest in social, local social history, the history of education, and particularly, as this paper illustrates, law enforcement. Uh, once this is all said and done, my email address there is adamskane at hotmail.co.uk. If any of you happen to have any questions about the sources or not just anything about this paper in general, you're more than welcome to get in touch uh, with me. Even if you want to share some insights yourself, every, uh, what did I say, every day is a school day. And uh, no on for Twitter. Right. <clears throat> so the way I think I'm going to work this sort of this presentation is I've got the main text of the paper here, and I'm going to be delivering from this pretty much throughout the lecture. But before I do that, there's a couple of things I want to say in advance that just contextualize the paper effectively. And the main way to do that is just methodology. Uh, pretty much as any historian will tell you, the way methodology effectively refers to the way a historian approaches their subject, how they interact with their sources, how they use their sources, and how they use them to construct a coherent narrative. That's a very simplified account for all the historians. Please forgive me, I'm only learning. So how I intend to approach this paper? Well, the thing is, police public relations in the context of Irish history, it tends to have been portrayed in a very binary way. We learn about the Irish War of Independence in broad strokes across the, the, you know, the island of Ireland. And what we happen in that is there are certain counties that tend to be more active than others, where the IRA did more, where the RIC, the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries committed far more atrocities than in other parts of the countries or in part of the country. And the result is that a lot of the nuance that comes from a local study, such as studying Carlo in depth, quite a bit of that gets lost in the, you know, in the grand tapestry of Irish history. So the way I propose to approach this is to look at a particularly paradigmatic county, one that illustrates the war as its most commonly understood. I mean, when we think of war of independence, we think of, you know, Michael Collins up in Dublin. We think of uh, Dan Breen, Tom Barry, we think of everything that happened in Cork. These are the things that we sort of learned about in school, and this is how we understand the Irish War of Independence. So the way I intended to approach this was that I looked at a county that was particularly violent, the one that we all know about, and that tends to be Cork County. It's one that's it's where the IRA were at their most active and when the police had kind of the most troublesome or troubling interactions with the public. So what I'll be doing in this paper is I'll be in the first half of the paper, I'll be looking at how the RIC interacted with the public and how the IRA interacted with the RIC in Cork County. And once we've established that as a baseline, what we'll go on to do then is compare us with what happened in Carlow. And so then you get a nice picture of the nation at large and how Carlow differed, if it differed at all, from that particular country or from that particular county. So the way you would do that, or the way I did it at least, was through a, as you can see the second point there, a close reading of primary sources against established secondary narratives. So I guess the best way to illustrate that particular point would be to look at a couple of select sources. And it's through these sources that I've sort of constructed my paper. So the way I did it was, if you look, you've got, a, you've got two types of main primary sources that occur throughout this paper. The first one uh, are local newspapers. These are things like uh, uh, the Stiberine Eagle, uh, no, actually, the Carlo Nationalist and Leinster Times. These were papers that every county or most, most counties and major towns would have had. And they reported on a diverse uh, range of, uh, in, of um, a diverse range of subjects. You would have had everything from the basics, such as uh, advertisements, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, petty sessions, the outcomes of them, a little bit like the court reports that we still see today. But then you'd also have international topics too. And the result was the public in, in your average county could be made very keenly aware of what was happening, not just within their own borders, but within the world at large. So local newspapers were particularly useful when it came to drilling down into the minutia, looking at what was happening every week in Carlo or in Cork, and basically seeing how these incidents were reported on. It was a great way to contrast that against the secondary sources. That's to say, much greater historians than me, much more experienced ones too, that have looked at all these things before and created essentially written history as we know it. 
we can then use these secondary sources, such as Michael Hopkins, the I Michael Hopkins is the Irish War of Independence. This was effectively a county by county study written uh, by Michael Hopkins, and I believe it was in 2004. And what we can do is we can see how, basically see how the war operated on a county by county basis, and then look at Carlo in relation to these county by county basis. The interesting thing is that in that particular book, I think Carlo features on like three pages. Very little, it would seem, appears to have happened in Carlo that was written about. And obviously, that's not true. Plenty did happen here. But the question then arises, why do we not know more about it? And that's where my paper comes in. The second bit here we have is the Bureau of Military History's witness statements. Uh, this was a project undertaken, I believe, in the 1930s, could be 40s. But what it was, it essentially involved the Irish uh, Free State and the Republic taking accounts from veterans and people who lived through the Irish Revolutionary Period. And they deposited their, um, their stories, their accounts, their memories of the war. And these were recently digitized, actually. So they're, uh, they're an historian's gold mine. Anybody in this room can access one if you've got a phone, a tablet, or a computer. So this is great, too, because then you can actually hear from people who witnessed these events, and in some cases made history itself, and explore their own perspectives on the issue. There's problems with all of these sources in some ways, but when you blend them all together, you can make a very coherent narrative. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we can move on from there. So, as I've said, we'll be comparing Cork and Carlo. Uh, these particular images uh, actually I think they're copies of the Ordnance Survey maps from, I think this one was 1903. These are all digitized as well, so they're great little snapshots into what the country actually looked like at a certain period of time. So, without further ado, I'm going to kick off on the paper here. And as I go along, I'll be moving it along. There's a couple of uh, great images and certain illustrated accounts, or yeah, great illustrations here that I'll be going. I'm putting up on screen along with the paper along with some brief summaries of everything I've been rambling on about. So, go from here. On the 2nd of August, 1919, the Nationalist and Leinster Times reported on the proceedings of the Carlisle Caesars. The presiding judge, a Justice Kenny, found much to commend in what he described as a, quote, peaceable and orderly county, a reputation Carlo had enjoyed for quite some time. Beyond the commission of petty crimes, those which could be expected during peacetime, Kenny seemed satisfied that the Anglo-Irish War, or better as we would know it, the Irish War of Independence, had yet to trouble his small domain. Officially, this ostensibly peaceful character was a consistent feature of Carlo's society for much of the war, but it was tempered with a definite sense of malaise. This was seemingly justified, for less than a year later, when a Justice Gibbon presided over the summer of season, he felt compelled to refuse the sheriff's gift of a pair of white gloves, an offering that was traditionally indicative of a crimeless county. Carlo's relationship with the RIC is one colored by a question of extent. On the one hand, Carlo was subject to many of the same tensions which troubled the nation at large. Barrack burnings and police ambushes, for example, were exceedingly common, particularly during the waning months of the war in 1920 to 21. But on the other hand, Many of these operations were conducted against buildings that had long been evacuated, or against patrols that had been forewarned of the, the rebels' intentions, allowing the RIC to engage on terms of their choosing. This presents a highly nuanced vision of Carlovian peace public relations, one which juxtaposes a period of crime and war against a period of order, creating a narrative of considerable complexity. So in order to effectively gauge Carlo's standing in relation to the island at large, it's important to briefly consider the RIC's place in Irish history and its resultant world role in the War of Independence. This can be best established by broadly comparing the conditions in Carlo to those of Cork, a county which perhaps best illustrates police public relations at their most paradigmatic. What follows, therefore, will attempt to situate the RIC within an appropriate historical context before proceeding to establish the nature of their activities in Cork County. In many respects, Cork represents a watershed county, one in which the war was at its most violent. Accordingly, it provides an excellent point of reference when considering the nature of the conflict in Carlow. 
So this is where we get on to the national narrative as it is in court. And this is a summary of what I'm going to be saying. So you're not missing much if y'all at home can't actually see that. But we've gone through great pains to make sure that you can. So on the 26th of June, 1920, the Nina Guardian reported on the death of RIC Constable James Brett. It was reported that Brett was returning to Bantry with five other constables, having answered a juror's summons to attend the local petty sessions the day previous. <clears throat> At the village of Flinney, the party was ambushed by a group of armed men. Brett was the first to fall, plucked from his bicycle by the first salvo. According to a post mortem that was conducted at a nearby Union Hospital, Brett had sustained a both terrible gash to the left side of his neck and a bullet wound four inches deep over his right eye. It was supposed that taken together, these two wounds resulted in an instantaneous death. And according to the uh, Irish deaths record, he was 52 years old at the time. Several weeks later, on the 14th of July, the late constable's death was broached in the House of Commons by a Colonel Ashley, the first Baron Mount Temple, who sought confirmation from Sir Hannah Greenwood the Chief Secretary of Ireland on the nature of Brett's funeral. According to Ashley, reports had been received which suggested that Brett was conveyed to his final resting place on the back of a military lorry. Greenwood, responding to Ashley's concerns, he confirmed that the quote facts were as stated and added that no local undertaker would supply a hearse or in any way assist in the burial of the late Constable Brett. No one attended the funeral, he says except the deceased's family, his comrades, and the military. Now, this is interesting because the events surrounding the death of Constable Brett neatly encompass the condition of Irish law enforcement during the waning years of the British administration. Wrapped by a conflict which had rapidly escalated over the course of a year, the RIC had ceased to be the community police force envisaged by their founder, Robert Peel, in the late 1830s. It had instead been forced to re-embrace its latent capacity as a quasi-military force, one which had been largely redundant since the Fenian Rising of 1867. But, as historian Richard Hawkins has argued, the RIC's return to arms was predicated upon a certain understanding of Irish nationalism, one which failed to acknowledge the changes in its approach to inter insurrection. Whereas the RIC of 67 had enjoyed the, the support of local informers, the Constabulary of 1920 was effectively boycotted by the general populace, preventing the preemptive pre actions which had proved so effective in the past. The result was a force that was, quote, seriously out of condition for its task, with neither the military might nor the public support to successfully discharge the civic duties. This process of boycott gradually gave way to a more militaristic form of resistance, that which ultimately result resulted in Brett's death. As early as October 1917, elements within the Irish Nationalist Movement, specifically in this case Sinn Féin, had started to, as the County Inspector of East Clare reported, and I quote, regard the police as their enemies and have ceased all friendly intercourse with them, end quote. By 1918, that friendly intercourse had been supplanted by physical assault. Constable John Burke, who was stationed in County Court, notes in an injury pension record he was assaulted by a crowd at the funeral of an Irish volunteer. Uh, the report indicates that he received several heavy blows, one of which rendered him unconscious and non-effective until January of 1919. I think he might have resigned after that, actually. You're wrong. Uh, events like this were, yeah, here we go. Events like this were often accompanied by a series of resignations, brought about by intimidation and coercion. Uh, these were particularly common during the 1920s, as indicated by the RIC's general personnel registers. Numerous constables during that period are said to have resigned as a result of threats against their parents. Instances of assault and intimidation persisted throughout the country's revolutionary period, though by 1919 onwards, following the example of Dan Breen and Solo Headbeg, they were conducted in tandem with armed ambushes and barrack burnings. And surprisingly, this is reflected in the constabulary's personnel registers, where during this period, the registers' margins are pointed by the words killed by armed assassins or murdered by rebels. In total, it's estimated that 624 members of the British security services were killed between 1919 and 1922. Now, I will put a caveat in that. That number, actually, when they say security services, they're not just referring to the Royal Irish Constabulary, but I suppose they are in a way, but they're also referring to the auxiliaries of the Black and Tan that were brought in to 
that will act as auxiliaries to the RIC. Um, I mean, whether you can call them security services is debatable, but that's how it's categorized, whether I do have some issues with that designation, but that's neither here nor there. So the general narrative of the War of Independence is essentially the RIC were first boycotted by the general populace before gradually coming into direct conflict with both the public and the IRA. Accordingly, Fort holds an interesting place in the historiography of that war. On the one hand, it was home to some of the war's most famous revolutionaries, such as Tom Barry and Michael Collins, and fielded several of the most effective flying columns in the country. Equally, however, it is also a region in which the level of violence has been significantly overstated. Now, this might stem from the literary nature of several of the combatants' memoirs, which generally sacrifice verity for narrative pace. And a great example of this is actually, it's very readable, it's actually a great book, um, Dan Breen's uh, My Fight for Irish Freedom. It was written in a bit of a hurry, I think, when he was in America, uh, right before he came back to Ireland before the Civil War. So he actually anticipated that he would die before it was completed. So he went through some pains to have everything put down quickly. And the result is, it actually reads like a work of fiction. It's, it's, it's true, but the events are very condensed. And so the result is a biography, an autobiography that feels quite literary. It's well worth a read. <clears throat> now, what was I? Uh, right, so taken together, this has contributed to a certain mythos around Fort's role in the war, one which has been further compounded by actions during the Civil War some years later. Now, it's impossible to deny that the Fort Brigade was among the most active in the country, though it would be erroneous to suggest that this gives credence to the level of violence that lingers in popular imagination. Now, I know it seems like I'm taking quite a bit of a runoff to get here, but it'll make sense when we get to Carroll. So, in 1919, Cork's relationship with the RIC was already fraught. Clashes with the police had become increasingly frequent in the wake, in the wake of the 1916 Rising, uh, such as that referred to by Ty Looney, Vice Commandant of the 2nd Fort Brigade, about an incident that occurred in Mallow during the 1917 anniversary of the Rising. To commemorate the event, Several members of his company raised a tricolor over a tree in Amalita, Amalita, the highest point in the locale. Now, the RIC took some exception to this and attempted to remove the flag, but they were impeded by several Irish volunteers who were subsequently tried with, quote, unlawful assembly and obstructing the RIC. And even their trial proved to be an ordeal, as Looney himself records. He says, uh, on the day of the trial, all volunteers in Morn Abbey went to Mallow and paraded through the town. The RIC tried to prevent the parade and made a number of baton charges. Several RIC and volunteers, as well as a number of onlookers were injured. And immediately following these incidents, there was an increase in interest by the general public and the volunteers and the membership of our organization or the membership of our company increased to about 60. So clearly there was some latent disaffection which came to a head before the ambush at Solo Headbear. Throughout 1918, the RIC were subject to varying degrees of hostility, and arguably the most benign was a localized boycott, predating actually the Dolls Decree of 1920, which stipulated that the volunteers should have no intercourse with the RIC. Patrick J. Lynch, a captain of the Bally Verney Company, recorded that in July 1918, his comrades papered Bally Verney with posters, calling for a general boycott of the Constabulary. Some evidence exists to suggest that their actions were successful, as in October of that year, the Irish examiner attests that a Mr. John Rear, presumably to Ali Gurney, was arrested for refusing to give a statement of his movements on the 6th of October. Instead, it seems that he, quote, declined to give any statement or answer any of the questions put to him. Now, far less ambiguous than this uh, were the acts of violence which in the light of the relatively early stages occurred with surprising regularity. In March, the Trillian Liberator attests that a group of armed men conducted a raid against the constabulary barracks at Eries, a rural station some five miles from uh, Castletown. Uh, no constables were injured, <clears throat> though four rifles were taken, along with a, a supply of bayonets, though the seizure of the latter is of some point of conjecture. At this point, it would seem that securing arms for the fledgling IRA was the primary motive for these transgressions. This is further supported by a series of hold-ups in which RIC members were intercepted and disarmed while on patrol. In October, the Skibbering Eagle states that two constables named Sullivan and Hamilton, respectively, were subject to an unprovoked attack in which they were waylaid, 
disarmed and badly beaten at Donamar near Bantry. It's interesting to note, however, that even as the conflict began to escalate, the paper records objections made by the local Catholic clergy, who state that the attack marred the, quote, good feeling hitherto existing between the people and the police in the district, end quote. And bear that in mind, actually, when we get to Carlo, because there's a prominent local figure who had a few things to say about that, actually. So the frequency of these transgressions was transient in character. And given that it was 1918, it could be attributed to the conscription crisis, during which the British government proposed to introduce mandatory military service across the island of Ireland. Now, up until that point, um, basically, in every constituent part of the British Isles, uh, every able-bodied man was expected to serve in the army during the Great War. Ireland was exempt from this until, I think it was April of 1918. And this was actually a great thing for Sinn Féin and the revolutionaries in general, because it united it pretty much everybody behind them. <clears throat> but Looney concludes as much in uh, regards to the conscription crisis in his witness report, noting that the volunteer numbers surged for the duration of the crisis, before stabilizing when the Great War concluded in November. A dedicated contingent remained, however, over several months before they could make a concerted effort against the RIC. The early months of 1919 then passed without major incident. Although the establishment of the first all wrought considerable political turmoil, but it initially failed to incite any major action against the RIC on a local level. This is perhaps unsurprising when one considers that the first engagements of the war were actually conducted without official sanction. Uh, several minor transgressions were reported, though little in particular. Though. A January edition of the Trilly Liberator states that the police barracks of Drummond was attacked by persons unknown. It seems that the assailants threw stones at the building while its occupants were asleep. And Looney's accounts, our old friend Looney, is similarly silent during this period, which may indicate that the first six months of 1919 were uh, represented a period of relative calm, which compared to what was become, to become a very turbulent decade. But this lull was short lived. From August of 1919, several of the county's more militant commanders, such as Tomas McCurtain and Terence McSweeney, Petition General Headquarters, or GHQ, for permission to assault local police installations. Though initially reluctant, they and uh, GHQ eventually relented, and that is reflected in the surge of anti establishment violence throughout the opening months of 1920. Now, I think it might be time to move on to Carrick 2 Hill, because this is arguably the most famous of these barracks to be burned in. Uh, at Carrick 2 Hill, a small garrison was overcome by between two to three hundred IRA men. Using revolvers, rifles, and hand grenades, the rebels seized the building after several hours of, of heavy fighting. Uh, the constabulary, it's said, as you can see here actually, uh, surrendered only when their ammunition had actually been exhausted. Now, Ty Blooney, who was present in the middle of all of this, uh, actually, he debates what the newspaper says. He claimed that they actually gave up in no time. So it's very hard to actually definitively say what happened, other than it happened. But it still represented a big moment because it was the first RIC barracks to actually fall by assault since the 1916 rising, and I think that was Ashburn and County Mead that one was. And so this was the first successful action against a constabulary barracks since. So it was quite a significant moment. The subsequent actions, of course, were less successful. Uh, simultaneously assaults on Timaleague and Mount Pleasant a month later, were repulsed by the constabulary. Uh, the former, I mind you, was said to have failed as a result of faulty equipment, a consistent complaint amongst the fourth IRA. Yet despite these qualified successes, the police appear to have slowly relinquished their hold on the rural locales. In April, a directive was issued from Dublin Castle which called upon the RIC to abandon its rural installations. And again, we'll see how that particular event plays out in Parliament later. And to instead fortify the country's urban centres, this served to accelerate a re uh, relational change which had been ongoing since 1918. With the RIC effectively absent from the countryside, the Republican courts, which had been gaining traction for over a year, were able to exp uh, exploit the result of power vacuum and informally establish themselves as the region's law enforcers. But by this time, the RIC had begun to take a less active role in the preservation of peace. As the conflict escalated, the IRA's offensive actions were commonly directed against the country's military and its police force. The Bureau of Witness Statements and the newspapers are replete with accounts of these actions. Sean Cotter, an adjutant of the 3rd Corps Brigade, records several engagements during the waning months of 1920. 
In August, he released the Bantry Battalion launched an assault against the RIC barracks, one in which several constables were killed and the installation was destroyed. According to Cotter, the barracks were abandoned the following day, and the Irish examiner corroborates its assertion, uh, assertion, stating that its 15 staff were subsequently evacuated by an armed trawler. Uh, shortly thereafter, Cotter's battalion conducted an abortive ambush against a military convoy, convoy in which the IRA were repulsed by reports of British regulars. And that's essentially how the war went for its duration, in what Michael Hopkinson described as a tit for tat violence under the troops of 1921. Now, tit for tat suggests a response on the part of, of the authorities. And although this section so far has only concerned itself with nationalist actions against the police, it seems only fitting that a closing word be made on how the constabulary responded to these transgressions. And I think we're probably all familiar with the most paradigmatic example of this exists in the, form, in the murder of Tomas um, Curtin, a member of the IRA and the Lord Mayor of Cork from January to March of 1920. Having played an integral role in the organization of the local IRA, McCurtain had been indir indirectly responsible for uh, the attacks on the RIC, and as a consequence, a group of semi-disguised men shot him at his home in March 1920. Following an inquest, it was discovered that the assailants were uh, uh, ununiformed members of the RIC, who considered that killing, or yes, the killing McCurtain would serve as a form of reprisal. Uh, Cork was later burned as things went on. So we can see reprisal, it was horrific. And we'll see a bit of that in Carlo as well as things go on. Uh, although this was a point of contention in the House of Commons, the so Lieutenant Colonel Malone posited that His Majesty's ministers were responsible for willful murder. An inquest later revealed that the RIC had indeed acted under orders and were ultimately responsible for McCurtain's death. Now, McCurtain's murder really does hi uh, highlight the binary nature of police public relations in Cork County. At the war's outset, Cork appears to have enjoyed a relatively stable relationship with its police force, albeit a troubled one, with lethal attacks against the constabulary being rare, and even the superficial assaults were met with disdain. But as the conflict progressed, relations steadily worsened as boycotts, ambushes, and barrack burnings became increasingly common. And from 1920 onward, it seems clear that the RIC had ceased to operate as agents of the law. As McCurtain's murder demonstrates, the RIC had re-embraced its latent role as a quasi-military force and was used to carry the fight to the IRA and, by extension, the Irish people. Now, this is why you're all here, isn't it? Uh, Carl, a word on Carl. It took a bit to sketch Cork, but the relevance, I think, comes through here. <clears throat> By comparison, the Carlow RIC appears, appears to have enjoyed a relatively cordial relationship with the police during the years which preceded the War of Independence. This may account for the subsequent dearth of contemporary scholarship pertaining to the war in Carlow. I could be wrong on that, but at the time of writing, Hopkinson's The Irish War of Independence was arguably one of the most detailed regional studies of the last decade. It alludes to Carlow's theater, the Carlow Theater of the War, thrice throughout the course of a 300 feet volume. One possible reason for this is an historical accord between police and people. Regions such as Cork were historically prone to disturbances, which may go some way towards accounting for the level of violence in the county. The Carlovian War, therefore, undisturbed by comparable levels of violence, may trace its character to the presidential harmony established during the pre-war years. But the important thing to note in every case is that's deeply relative. There was always unrest, there was always latent dissatisfaction, but it never seemed to reach, it never bubbled over to the same extent as maybe it did elsewhere. The fact that Justice Kenny could so confidently assert the peaceable qualities of the county is a testament to the possibly traditionally law-abiding nature of its citizenry. citizenry. Now, there are, of course, practical elements to this phenomenon. Uh, Padre Kane, an adjutant of the Carlo Brigade and a post official at the Carlo Post Office, no relation whatsoever, by the way, no connection to it at all, that I'm aware of. But he made reference to uh, the proactive character of the RIC in the Carlo area. According to Kane, the Carlo Brigade was hampered by frequent disruption, as the RIC repeatedly preempted leaks within the Postal Service by arresting any staff found to have connections with the IRA. For example, following the arrest of a Michael Carpenter, a Carlo man residing in Kildare, for the possession of illegal wiretapping instructions. Kane attests that the homes of disloyal, quote, post office officials were repeatedly raided. 
This was compounded by the fact that throughout 1920, raids and arrests were alleged to have severely depleted company, battalion, and brigade staff. The bureaucratic mechanisms, which enabled the IRA to operate as an effective force elsewhere, replacements were therefore exceedingly common and imprisoned with such regularity that King claims, quote, it was now impossible to remember Paul. So Kane's account of the RIC's operational efficacy poses a pertinent, albeit tangential, question about Carlo's localist demographic. Traditionally, the RIC relied upon local informants and a cordial relationship with the public in order to achieve its ends. <clears throat> this was neatly illustrated by the forces work during the Fiend Rising of 1867, where local uprisings were effectively quelled by advanced knowledge of their intentions. Bearing this, bearing this in mind, it's pertinent to ask whether or not the Carlo RIC were assisted by a loyalist component of the county's population. Now, it's very difficult to actually answer a question like that definitively because you can never really get into people's heads during this period. But there are some anecdotal accounts of difficulties uh, in the witness statements that the IRA had for the local public. Uh, Michael Dorley, for instance, recalls that in August and September of 1920, Several parties were sent into the countryside to gather guns and arms. And although the night's dividend was approximately 40 shotguns, one man refused to surrender his weapon until Michael Reagan threatened to burn down his house. On another occasion, Kane recalls that the police barracks in Great Cullen was vandalized by a group of local volunteers with more enthusiasm than sense. That's a quote. Is there anyone from um, Great Cullen? <laughs> Good. I know, I know, it's not technically Carlo, it's Leash, the first lockdown taught us that the hard way, but still, for the sake of the argument, <clears throat> your honorary Carlovians tonight, I suppose. <laughs> but these youths were subsequently reported to the authorities by a, quote, watchful loyalist, who was later told by the IRA to vacate the town within 24 hours or face reprisals. Now, while these accounts are essentially anecdotal and give little definitive insight to the, into the dominant allegiance of the county, there are enough to suggest the possibility of an accord between certain locals and the RIC. And this is one possible reason uh, uh, to account for the difficulties that the IRA had when faced with attempting to wage war on the RIC during this period. The lay of the land, too, the topography, that's another thing that may have abetted the RIC's efforts to uh, maintain order. Both Kane and Nan Nolan, a member of the, uh, the Ballon Common Man, allude to the relative ease with which the IRA and later the military were able to patrol the roads which crisscrossed the county. At Samuel Lewis's topographical dictionary of Ireland, which admittedly was written in 1832, but the landscape didn't change drastically here in that period. So it's still, it's still fairly relevant. It gives some insight into this phenomenon. While Cork, with its quote, undulating terrain and great longitudinal ranges of high ground, was well suited to IRA hit and run operations, the Carlow Brigade enjoyed few such advantages. Uh, Carlo's landscape was generally better suited to ag agriculture and was cultivated accordingly, resulting in both superior infrastructure and comparatively level terrain. IRA operations were therefore severely impeded by the fact that the authorities could control the countryside with ease uh, and had uh, effect able to rouse out fugitives that were, quote, on the run and negating large scale ambushes and assaults before they had an opportunity to materialize. As Kane remarked on the activities of the 1st Carlo Battalion, the greater part of the 1st Battalion was in North Carlo, and it was so bisected and intersected with roads that any position sighted could be overrun or surrounded. It seems reasonable to infer then that the peaceful nature of Carlo uh, was informed by the use of possible pre existing amity between the police and the public, and by the, unviability, the unviable nature of the local terrain. In this regard, Carlo deviates quite considerably from the narrative established by Court. The course of the war itself, however, does present certain corollaries of police and public relations in Court. Beginning as early as 1918, before the onset of violent resistance, the several tensions arose between the RIC and the general population. One example is recorded in the 1918 edition of The Nationalist, where the drapery of a Mrs. Latham was raided for, quote, seditious literature. The result was that several Sinn Féin pamphlets and a portrait of Thomas Ashe, a founding member of the IRB, uh, were seized. Similar actions were taken throughout the county. Uh, the county. Uh, again, Michael Dorley, the future uh, commanding officer of the Carlo Brigade, attested he was arrested in August of 1918 for his part in reciting the Sinn Féin party manifesto at the party's um, 
uh, Corla Counter. These arrests may have been well founded. Nay, Patrick Doyle, the then rector of Knockbeck College in Carlow Town, records that as early as 1917, uh, a Goroid O'Sullivan, a veteran of the 1916 Rising, had begun to train local volunteers in preparation for another rebellion. Whatever the case, it's worth noting that the raids such as the one on Mrs. Blackburn's bravery were anything but an anomalous occurrence. We have to remember that the Great War was still ongoing at this time, and although Germany and the Central Powers were all but defeated, the defense of the Realm Act was still in force. And broadly speaking, this act labeled any entity which might undermine the war effort as seditious. And because the British blamed Sinn for the right east arising on Sinn Fein, more or less erroneously, it must be said, anybody that had a Sinn Fein affiliation was instantly suspect under the terms, uh, the terms of the Defense of the Realm Act. And so these incidents may have been fairly mundane and not necessarily disruptive. <clears throat> but with the onset of hostilities in 1919, Carlo presented itself as a fairly stable county. The newspapers of the period provide little insight into anything else was strictly ordinary. As was the case in 1918, the authorities appear to have harbored a lingering doubt about the intentions of Sinn Féin, though again, it doesn't seem to have been particularly disruptive. One peculiar instance, however, did present itself in the form of some explosives that were seized by, uh, seized by the RIC in April. Uh, the consignment of dynamite was seized in Tullow on route to Ballon, where witness statements indicate a significant amount of IRA activity before being safely conveyed to Carlo. So although evidence or events of this character do represent the exception rather than the rule, it seems reasonable to argue that definite tensions existed in the council, particularly amid fears that the events of Solo Headbag would eventually repeat themselves in Carlo. And this is, I think, where we begin to get into the clerical aspects, because in early February of 1920, Patrick Foley, the Bishop of Kildare and Lotham, gave voice to these fears in a pastoral letter. And I quote, he says, uh, those men who profess belief in the great truths, that's to say the doctrines of the church, have engaged in robberies and burnings and gross intimidation and flagrant injustice, the, per uh, the perpetration of which has, con has contributed materially to the spirit of lawlessness, which prevails so widely over all the country. You can kind of hear echoes here of what the clergy were saying in court at the time. It's possible there may have been a church line on this. I'm not completely sure. It wouldn't be out of character. That's how it goes. It's a monolith. So that's a possible reason. But he does take a fairly even-handed approach to this too, because Foley then proceeds, uh, proceeds to record a dastardly attempt made on the life of a local policeman who was shot while receiving a newspaper through the barrack door. Now, the language he uses is particularly interesting, given that robberies, burnings, and gross intimidation were exactly the species of lawlessness that was ongoing in court at that time. So clearly, from about 1920 onward, Carlo was coming to closely resemble the likes of court. And I think, just to liven things up a bit, we've got the controversial Great Column Barracks. It's a lovely old building. Uh, that's it from 1918. And then, courtesy of Google Maps, we have from 2018, too. Interestingly, you happen to have a, a, a couple of members of the constabulary. They were posing outside that building, and it's one of the more famous pictures of the RIC from that period. But yeah, they just happened to be outside the Great Column Barracks door. It's a nice bit of continuity there. Then we have a, we've got the barracks here from Bottom Bridge. I can't see, I don't believe the ruins are there anymore, but I'm honestly open to contradiction there. You can see there where it's noted in the, uh, the important survey maps, you can see what the constabulary barracks should be. I can see what looks to be a frame when you go there today, but it was, I know that it, I think it was burnt out during the war. I'm not sure if anything was ever put instead. And as I said, this is a learning curve for me. Every day is a school day. So if anyone wants to pipe up afterwards, feel free. And then we've got Bishop Patrick Foley. He was the Bishop of Kildare and Lachlan from 1896 to 1926. Uh, he actually, it's funny, his papers can actually be found in the Delaney Archive in Carlow College, which is actually well worth popping into at any stage. They don't pay me to say that anymore, by the way. I just, it's a, it's a really good archive. It's well worth it. Uh, but that's where that picture came from. And since we're talking about St. Pat's, he was actually the president, I believe, for about four years there before he was succeeded by his brother when he took the, um, uh, yeah, then he became Bishop of Kildare in Lockham. So there's more than a couple, I think he was a lot of the bridge man himself, actually. I could be wrong on that, but there we go. Okay, we'll 
yet. We'll get to that one later. <clears throat> so the earliest and most overt manifestations of the um, violence in Carlo uh, were the barrack burnings. Carlo's peaceable qualities, coupled with the efficiency of its law enforcement institutions, appear to have impeded actions against police barracks until this point. Following the Dublin Castle's evacuation directive in March or April, all of the county's rural barracks were vacated in order to consolidate the RIC's full and urban centres. In January 1920, the bi-yearly RIC list and directory, this was effectively a book that listed all the RIC personnel, where all the, the addresses of all the different barracks were in particular areas. It's a really interesting source. I found a couple of them online, um, but there's two of them as far as I know, they're great points of comparison. But this list and directory records that 13 stations existed throughout Carlow County, but of these only four, Carlow, Tullow, Bagnallstown, and Hackettstown were considered urban posts, meaning that the remainder would be abandoned by April. Uh, which is interesting, actually, if I'm not mistaken, I think the one in Bagnallstown at the time, and I could be wrong on this, but I think it is actually now where Super Valley is now, of all places. It's in that neck of the woods. All the things have become. Uh, in several cases, mounting, uh, yes, uh, in several cases, mounting pressure appears to have compelled the RIC to evacuate their rural holdings prematurely. Rathbilly and Lockman Bridge Barracks, for example, appear to have been vacated in late 1919, although they were not actually burned until April and May of 1920. This poses a question of causality. If the barracks were vacated in 1919, seemingly in the face of little resistance, why did local IRA wait until the evacuation directive of 1920 to move against what was effectively an empty building? <clears throat> now, there are several possible answers to this. The first relates to Kane's claim about the country's topography. Although the barracks were abandoned, it's possible to suppose the flat terrain and road network impeded concerted action against the rural apparatus of British rule. Consequently, exceptions to Carlo's prevailing terrain were generally preferred as IRA training grounds. Uh, I think uh, Shay Kinsler observed in a recent study of the 1921 Bally Murphy ambush, uh, it was actually in The Nationalist, I think a couple of months ago, it was a two-part essay, it's well worth reading. And um, the Kyler IRA did their utmost to ensure that their training grounds were situated in hilly or mountainous regions, such as those in uh, Kaleshan, uh, or the Black Sears Mountain on the Wicklow border. But this is a purely military explanation, and it is possible that the relationship between police and people played a salient role in the course of the conflict. Uh, it's common knowledge that the RIC were deeply embedded within their respective locales, and it's often extended to renting property to act as a barrack. Consequently, when the IRA began its campaign of barrack burnings in March and April, Bishop Foley observed that the burnings, quote, a big burden on the ratepayers. This is further corroborated by the Nationalist, which actually seldom records the fact of the barrack burning itself, but instead draws attention to the compensation claims made by its owner. Uh, Lord Rathdonald, for example, applied for a £1,000 settlement worth of compensation for the destruction of the barrack in Rathbilly, while Henry Beach and Cornwall Brady saw a £3,000 settlement for the burning of the barrack and courthouse in Michel. Now, bearing this in mind, it's possible to argue that a resultant economic symbiosis between the police and the people acted as a deterrent to IRA action. In other words, if the police were seen to contribute to the locale in a meaningful way, it's unlikely that a local population would endorse activity that was directly opposed to their own interests. And these burnings can basically constitute most of Carlo's wartime activity until around September. Allen Barrack, for example, was fired uh, in May 3rd by the 3rd, by the 3rd Battalion Carlo Brigade. But it's worth noting that these burnings themselves, as you might have guessed, bore very little relation to these dramatic sieges like what you had at Carrick Two Hill. And by comparison, actually, they seem to maybe a bit more symbolic rates. Uh, yep, that's right. The closest Carlo appears to have come to Cork in this regard was an isolated incident in Bagnallstown, where the local IRA, quote, sniped at the RIC barracks, preventing its occupants from interfering with another job nearby. But by this point, barrack burning graduated to ambushes upon police constables and patrols. Uh, the first of these took place in Tullow on the 16th of September when three constables, uh, Delaney, Gotham, and Halloran, were approached by a group of between 15 and 20 armed men. Uh, a one sided firefight ensued and con uh, concluded with the deaths of Delaney and Halloran. Uh, according to Michael Fitzpatrick, the vice commandant of uh, the Carlo Brigade's 3rd Battalion, one of the constables was rumoured to have tendered his resignation to the RIC and was expected to leave the force the following week. 
and uh, speaking of explosives being delivered to Tullow a few years earlier, it might have been a bit of foreshadowing because reprisals followed just a day later as British forces detonated a bomb which destroyed several businesses and set the town on fire. And I've actually just been told that there's a great account of the Nationalist where how the fire brigade got involved in all of that. So once again, an interesting piece that I knew nothing about at the time. Uh, unsurprisingly though, this incident marked a watershed moment in the changing character of Carlovian police public relations. Although the Carlow District Inspector, TPD Townsend, remarked that still very good relations existed between the police and the people in these parts, attacks on police controls indicate that Carlow is beginning to resemble some of the country's more militant counties. Bishop Foley's personal correspondence directly refers to the implications of the Tullow attacks and provides some commentary on Carlo's relationship with the nation uh, at large. In a letter to Dr. Michael J. Murphy, Foley stated that, quote, the murders of the police in Tullow are, I fear, evidence of the, res the resolution of the insurgents to push their campaign into the district, which has hitherto been free from their depredations. But on the other hand, he also, applied, he also opined that the administration's reprisals were calculated to drive the people into open warfare. So we can see again how the war gradually got dirtier as the, as the months progressed. And I think that this event neatly encapsulates the nature of wartime police public relations in Carlow County. For although the individual <coughs> men, the constable themselves, were often well respected, <coughs> Uh, which that's actually attested in several uh, statements, they came to be regarded as an arm of the enemy rule, thus bringing Carlo into close, uh, close accord with the general state of the nation. And attacks of this character persisted until the truce of July 1921. It's worth noting, however, that they were seldom as dramatic as the Tullow ambush of 1920 and were often conducted in an abortive fashion. For example, in March, Sergeant Del Boyle was assaulted en route from the Carlo barrack which I actually gather is now a pub called The Barracks, go figure. Uh, yeah, he was en route to his residence in Great Column. But according to the joint testimony of the Nationalist and Quadrant Kane, a boil was shot twice before returning fire. Although wounded, he's said to have survived as a result of a chain mail vest he donned before departing the barrack. Now that detail is particularly important because it suggests, it suggests that relations had deteriorated to the point that O'Boyle was actively expecting some sort of violence. But also, again, to be fair and balanced, it would be erroneous to suggest that the mindset was indicative of a universal enmity between police and people. Uh, the, uh, a Sergeant McAvoy stationed in Carlow Town was said to have resigned his post after 25 years of service in April of 1921 and was at According to the Nationalist, he was well liked by both his peers and the general public, still indicating there was the potential for mutual respect. But that mutual respect by that point was strained to breaking point. And as I said, any respect accrued to the individual constables during this, their service. By the time of the truce, it had become another casualty of the war, as the character of law enforcement in Carlo deviated wildly from Robert Peel's vision of peace policing by consent. Instead, a gulf had emerged between the police and the public they ostensibly served, one deepened by the war's escalatory character and the tit-for-tat violence that followed in its wake. <clears throat> Yet in spite of this, it will be erroneous to suggest that Carlo and Corp were comparable in terms of violence and dissidence. While the fundamental nature of the conflict, consisting of boycotts, barrack burnings and ambushes, is broadly consistent across county lines, uh, the question of extent and underlying uh, tensions belie comparison. As a paradigm for the nation at large, Cork appears to embody much of the militant focus that is largely absent from Carl. But as this paper indicates, it's difficult to definitively account for why this was the case. A relatively amiable relationship between the police and the public during the pre one years is one possible reason. Even a compliant minority has the potential to undermine the efforts of local revolutionaries if their efforts are properly directed. Coupled with the county's topographical and military position, it may be positive that the social dynamic between the Carlo public and the RIC had a tangible effect on the course of the war within a regional context. Further so, the demographic, social, and economic makeup of the county during this period would doubtless have had further study and would go considerable lengths towards explaining Carlo's somewhat unique revolutionary experience. And maybe there's just two small things. I'm sorry for taking up your time, but this one here I shamelessly lifted from the Carlo County Museum's website because I actually think it's a brilliant piece. 
Uh, for any of you that haven't been to the County Museum, it's basically a snapshot of social history in Carlo. Generally, I think, well, you could charitably say the 19th century onwards, but they have one great section on law and order and education, policing. They've got the old gallows that are now where the Carlo shopping centre is, where pennies used to be. But they also have this. It is the actual emblem that would have hung above, I believe, uh, the old RIC barracks at Carlo at the time. Uh, which is just really interesting. They've got this great thing at the moment going in A to Z of their artifacts in the museum, which bits of Irish history that are represented in their collection, literally from A to Z. That's Tullow Barracks, as you can see. There's actually still a guard station roughly in the same area, so I mean, consistency of nothing else. And then finally, just a word on the sources. Uh, as I said, I'm deeply indebted to the Bureau of Military History's witness statements. They give some great contemporary accounts of the war that can be very easily read against secondary sources and newspaper articles. Uh, I've already talked about the Lady Archive, uh, the National Archives in Dublin. I could be here all year about that, but anything there is incredible. Uh, the Hansard Parliamentary debates. These are great if you want to establish Ireland, how Ireland was being discussed in the context of uh, the British Parliament. Often there's debates around Irish policy that play out there. These are all available online, again, digital sources are marvelous. Uh, and then you just have a couple of select um, what do you call it? Um, newspapers that I found very useful. The Irish Examiner was a great one because it's a court paper. The Nationalist and Leinster Times is still going strong, so they're doing something right. And then the Skibbery Eagle again, it's another court paper, but these all give great insights into local, national, and international affairs. Then finally, last but not least, the secondary sources. Uh, Donald J. O'Sullivan, the Irish Constabularies. Uh, it's a century, basically an overview of the RIC. It's a great general history. Uh, Morris Walsh's Bitter Freedom. It was a book that was written, I think, it was supposed to situate Ireland in, in an international context, the Irish Revolutionary Period. And it's very effective in that regard. It was a great section on the RIC and how they were perceived by the public. It's a great book to even dip in and out. And uh, Michael Hopkinson, the Irish War of Independence. I sold that man incredibly well, I think. And then finally, this is more of a primary source, but it's a Robert Curtis, The History of the Royal Irish Constabulary. This was a book written in 1871. You can find it fairly easily on archives.org. It's a book that basically looks at the IC from its establishment in 1922 or 1822, up until a little bit before the, a um, little bit after the Fenian Rising. It's just a really interesting book to see how people thought about the RIC at that particular moment in time. I actually don't know how long I've gone on for. I expect no, it's maybe longer than I should have done. No, no, no. Perfect. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. And um, I'd be happy to field any questions to the best of my ability. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>
Others, I think, did go on to serve on Guardian, work in the new on Garda Shia But the only issue with that was, as I said, they were still, was, they were tired with the association of being essentially suppressing the course of Irish freedom. So not many took up that offer. There were some, but not all. And then others, while they were encouraged to join colonial police forces, there was a very generous pension, I believe, that was offered to them by the British government, which did disincentivize service in other parts of the empire. So to answer your question, I'm not too sure about the Carlo dimension specifically, though it is possible, but generally they either uh, joined other colonial police forces, some of them, I believe, went on to serve in Angarda Shirkana, and then others just took the pension and retired. Um, but no, it's a great question, and it is something I would like to look into in more detail, because it's a natural progression from this particular story. But thanks for that. Another question? Yes, this gentleman here. Yeah. Was there a higher proportion of people in common or the Crown forces than Corps? And if so, would that have contributed to the lack of enthusiasm to take on the RIT in power? Uh, yeah, um, if, if I'd be right in saying the question there was, um, <clears throat> was there a higher proportion of individuals who would have served in Crown forces in Carlo relative to Cork, and whether that might have impacted the sort of public order or the sense of uh, amity in Carlo relative to Cork? I'll be honest, I, I actually don't know. I didn't look specifically into, we would say, into how the proportion of Carlo men that might have, say, gone on to serve in the British Army. Uh, so I actually couldn't say. You could do some conjecture, conjecture if you look at maybe one particular way Carlo went down on the side of the um, the John Redmond side of things. I know my old supervisor, Elaine Callaghan, might have been able to speak to that. But in terms of that, the, the way it went, a lot of them, um, John Redmond did encourage a lot of his, the Irish volunteers to join up in the British Army, go abroad in pursuit of home rule. Now, I don't know what way Carlo and Cork fell on, fell on that side of the divide, but that might have represented a number of, you know, young men that might have gone off to fight. But as for that, I'm actually not sure, but it's, I, I'd love to find out. It's that's something I'm, I might look into if you don't mind. Not much of an answer, but thank you. Lily? Thank you very much. Um, I have a Um, yeah, so I think it, Lily was it? Yes. Yeah, uh, Lily's question was um, when the RIC would have been, uh, when they were getting recruits for the RIC, uh, would I be right in saying the question sort of what sort of did they target a specific demographic? How did they go about recruiting? And the interesting thing was that the, the RIC was an interesting police force because they generally tended to recruit from, well, they were Irish people who recruited to join. Now, if you joined in Carlo, there's no way, on, it's very unlikely that you'd be stationed in Carlo, because obviously if you've got local connections, it's very hard to be impartial and to discharge blind justice if I actually know who Mickey is over there and is married to my sister. There's all an obvious conflict of interest. So they were generally stationed elsewhere. Um, but the general thing with the RIC as well was in terms of demographics, it was quite a popular position because the local constable tended to be quite well respected within his local community. And it offered a chance for advancement. So if you were somebody that maybe you were, you were from a poor family or you were of limited means, you joined the RIC, you end up becoming a pillar of whatever community you're posted to. And you do actually have the chance to advance. You'll be well respected by your community. You're on a fairly decent wage. And it's, it was just generally a it was it was a it was a great um, way of affording social mobility. So I suppose the demographic would have been if you were of limited means, uh, it was a great way of actually getting up in the world. Whether they targeted people like that specifically or it was just an incidental thing uh, is another question. But for certain, there were it was a there were a certain type of people who were drawn to service, and it was quite often the folks that maybe would have liked to have got up in the world, but. Maybe didn't have the privilege of birth to do it. Uh, I think if that answers your question. Have we any further questions or comments? <laughs>
Something came in online. No, check it in. Yes. Um, would it be right to say that my consequence were recruit Catholics were allowed to join, right? Mm -hmm. But to move up the ranks, which are quite a bit of the so that the Irish Catholics could guide did not progress very high up. So is, is that a correct view? Um, I suppose just to uh, I'll repeat that there. Um, I suppose the, the question was, I think, that um, if uh, while it was true that you could join if you were a Catholic, you perhaps weren't expected that you could advance to a certain point, but you weren't likely to surpass that point unless you were maybe English or possibly Protestant, Church of Ireland, let's say. Um, I'm not sure specifically. Like, I mean, I know, for example, if you were, to, I remember looking at uh, the 1911 census records, for example. I was particularly looking at the Michel Barracks. And you'll, the Barracks was cohabited by Catholics and Protestants. And I believe that you could at the very least get to sergeant if you were a Catholic, which was still tended to be quite high up in the local hierarchy. Um, but in terms of advancement with the RIC, I'm not sure. But I do know that a lot of Irish people who might have got to a certain point, in, say the RIC, a lot of them did also go to India and join the civil service there. They tended to you the actual the nature of your religion or your background didn't matter so much abroad. So it was possibly an avenue for advancement, but I'm not so sure about the Irish context. I know that the further you went from Ireland, as in into the British Raj, for example, in India, the fact that you were Catholic was immaterial. Um, I'm trying to think, was it O'Dwyer? I think it was O'Dwyer, it was the Lord the City Advisor of India during the Amaritsar massacre in 1919. But again, he was actually he was from Tipperary and he was um, from a Catholic background. So in some parts of the British service, um, yeah, your birth or your religion was no impediment to advancement. But I can't say definitively for the RIC in the context of Ireland. Sergeant for sure, but I, I'm not completely sure beyond that. But thanks, it's a really good question, I'll say. Thank you. One, one, yeah. Uh, one question online. Uh, yeah, a comment, um, Adam, uh, from uh, Shay Kinsler. Fantastic presentation, Adam. Uh, if this is indeed a first public address, we have a lot to look forward to from you in the future. Huge congratulations. Uh, just one observation, the remarkably healthy relations between the RIC and the public at large was indeed a stumbling block towards the IRA activism in 1920. Conscientious objections uh, from the leadership of the Carlo Brigade to the killing of RIC actually led to the enforced resignations from GHQ of many Carlo Brigade officers in November 1920. The IRAOC Sean Farrell at that time was courting a daughter of an ex RIC sergeant at the time. Uh, so that's the comment from uh, Shay. <laughs> that's that's made by evening actually. <laughs> well, thank you. And if you're the same Shay Kinsley, I think, who did publish that piece in the Nationalist, I you're I actually I really enjoyed it. It was a brilliant piece. I remember reading, I was very impressed by it. But thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed this talk. And yeah, honestly, I look forward to reading the, your, your more of your, your more of your work in times to come. Thank you very much and appreciate the information. Have we any other comments or questions? If we haven't, um, I'm, I'm going to invite uh, Lynn to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, Richard. And yeah, just to say 100 years has passed since the War of Independence um, in Ireland, which marks a time to reflect and review. And studies like this give us a chance to do that in a well-researched and considered way, um, which is a great opportunity for us. And the comparative analysis with Cork gives us context for the Carlo experience and the research papers, um, the witness statements, the literature provides a really extensive review for us. Um, so we're delighted to have Adam with us and sharing this research research and sharing his insights with us and we know there's lots more to come so we're we're openly inviting waiting for the next paper um adam we'd be delighted uh, to to have you again and we look forward to that we'll be keeping you on the radar 
and watching intently um, for the next pieces of work. Uh, so we're, like I said, delighted to have them along this evening. And so on behalf of the Carlo Historical and Archaeological Society, I'd like to propose a vote of thanks for our wonderful speaker this evening, Adam Kay. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, and uh, uh, a big thank you to Lynn and Gary and Paul here as well who have uh, helped in, in this evening's uh, uh, preparation and uh, the delivery uh, uh, through online uh, workings. Um, their, their, their skills have uh, been greatly enhanced during this process because uh, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, IT and uh, this sort of thing. Uh, I'm afraid I think very much at the bottom of the scale, but they're doing well. And we thank them for that. We do hope that those of you online really enjoyed this lecture and that it came through clearly. A um, little bit of housekeeping. Um, the next lecture uh, of the Carl Historical and Archaeological Society will be on Wednesday, the 17th of November. Uh, it will be given by Chris Power. And we've had Chris here before giving a lecture. Um, uh, he's uh, uh, based, in, well, he originally came from Arco, but he, uh, he's very familiar here with Carlo. Um, he's going to speak on the records of Carlo J. So that will be here in the Seven Oaks and probably will be online as well by Zoom because I, I'm, 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 I'm hoping we won't be in further lockdowns than it will be where we are at the moment, but that will mean that we can't uh, have um, a fully uh, a, a sort of people present lecture, uh, we, will, we will require the Zoom, uh, uh, the Zoom link as well. So we hope that those of you online and those of you here present this evening will uh, come along to that lecture on the 17th, Wednesday the 17th of November. Um, there are old copies of Carlo Viana. Well, I, just this year's, really. Uh, this year's copies of, uh, or I should say, the 20, 2021, because the 2022 one will be launched uh, coming up to Christmas. Uh, it will be in November, but the launch of the date, I think, has been fixed, but uh, it doesn't come to mind immediately. But you'll hear about that anyway, and it'll be, it'll be in, the, in the press. So um, the, the copies are available here and they're certainly well worth purchasing. I'm sure many of you have them already, but if you don't, um, uh, please do uh, purchase one from Gary uh, after, after the, the lecture this evening. Um, we don't charge for lectures, but we're always happy to accept donations if that's your wish, but that's totally up to you. And I think there's a, a box at the, yeah. at the door for that. Yeah. So, um, Membership also, if you're interested in joining the Carlo Historical and Archaeological Society, talk to Gary or Lynn or Paul or myself even. Uh, and um, after afterwards, and we're always delighted to have new members uh, in the society. I think that concludes this evening. And again, big thank you to you, Adam. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and we wish you well in your further studies in Trinity. Yep. and uh, wish you well in the future and thank you again so thank you all very much for attending this evening uh, we're very pleased to see so many of you here um, stay safe and a very safe journey home thank you very much mm -hmm.